on behalf of the Sarah Initiative, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to this morning's uh, webinar. I'm very pleased to invite my close friend and a very old friend of mine, Craig Lockhart, to spend some time with us this morning to talk about uh, his PhD on Sarawak and Kuching in particular. So before we start, let me just quickly introduce uh, Craig to all of you. Craig A. Lockhart was Ben and Joyce Rosenberg Professor of History in the Department of Social Change and Development at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, where he taught courses on Asian, African, and world history for 35 years. He was twice a Fulbright Hayes Professor at the University of Malaya, where he taught the histories of Sabah and Sarawak. He first arrived in Kuching, where he researched Sarawak history back in 1965, and he spent another year in Kuching from 1970 to 1971. Craig holds a PhD from the University of Wisconsin Medicine in Southeast Asian history and comparative world history in 1973. And he obtained his master's in Asian studies from the University of Hawaii in 1967. He has published many articles and reviews on Malaysian, Southeast Asians, overseas Chinese, comparative and world history and on popular music. He is well known to many Sarawak scholars because of his book called From Kampong to City, A Social History of Kuching, Malaysia, 1820 to 1970, which was published back in 1987. He's also published a best-selling book called Southeast Asia in World History that was recently published in 2009. And he's also published a very well-regarded book called Dancers of Life, Popular Music and Politics in Modern Southeast Asia, which came out in 1998. He's also published a book called Old Sarawak, a Pictorial Study, that was published by the Borneo Literature Bureau in 1972, and it was republished by the Dewan Basa and Pustaka in 1992. I think many of us who are interested in Sarawak will have a copy of that book. So Craig will speak for about 45 minutes, and after that, we will have a QA and a session. And if you have any questions, please type in your questions in the chat box on YouTube. So over to you, Craig. Welcome to you all. Uh, uh, I, we had a few glitches getting this ready the last hour or so, and I do apologize for any glitches we might have down the pike here. This is the first time I have given a Zoom talk. Uh, especially to such an informed and distinguished audience. I can't see you, but I assume you are out there. I want to talk about my experience and, in and observations of Sarawak, especially Kuching, in the 1960s and very early 1970s, when I lived the, and recent research there, and then offer a few thoughts on changes in Sarawak since then. Here you can see my wife, Kathy, and I, uh, in front of the uh, house that we lived in just off of Green Road in 1969 and 70. Tonight I'm offering more of a personal view uh, than a scholarly view, uh, since my scholarly writings, I think, speak for themselves. Also, regretfully, I have not been able to get back to visit Sarawak for nearly two decades due to other obligations personal and academic. I hope to get back one of these days, maybe next year. I have, however, been able to keep up to some degree with things Malaysian, especially Sarawakian, through a variety of publications and Facebook groups. It's wonderful to see the interests and work of local historians in Kuching such as Edgar Ong, Philip Yong, and Veronica Chang-Schmidt, who post daily post interesting and valuable information and photos, old and new, on Facebook. It's amazing that they have attracted hundreds, even thousands of readers for their posts, many of them living in Sarawak. I am sorry to say I do not have thousands of readers for my Facebook posts. I have also learned very much from my colleagues in the official Malaysia Singapore Brunei Studies Group, 
uh, as well as from uh, posts from the Malaysia Singapore Society of Australia and other groups, as well as prolific observers of things Malaysian and Bornean, such as the prolific writer and astute political observer, James Chin, whose book on S S the Sarawak United People's Party I reviewed many years ago. New sources such as the Free Malaysia Today and Malaysia Kini are also very helpful in keeping up. I must also admit that Kuching became one of my favorite cities in the whole world. I loved living there. I want to thank James Chin and the Sarawak Initiatives Project for inviting me to do this presentation. With all that said, let me talk <laughs> about Kuching in the 1960s. In 1965, I started a new chapter in my life when I arrived via Borneo Airways in Kuching as a 23-year-old graduate student to research a thesis for my master's degree in history at the University of Hawaii. During my year-long sojourn, I collected information on the history of the Chinese in Sarawak under the first two Brook Rajas and particularly on their immigration to Sarawak. Some of the folks I met were curious as to why I came from the highly developed United States to the remote place of Sarawak, a, a, a territory that few Americans had heard of at that time. Let me begin by addressing that question. My interest in diaspora Chinese communities in Sarawak had been building for some years. I grew up and had my pre-college education in Pasadena, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. The dynamic LA area was a magnet for large numbers of immigrants from all over Asia. For example, Pasadena, my hometown, was home to many Chinese and Japanese. Uh, but also had a small population of Indonesian refugees who had arrived in the 1950s and 1960s. Some of you may have heard or been fans of the rock group, the Van Halens, uh, who uh, grew up in Pasadena, but were born in Indonesia. Their mother was Javanese. I occasionally visited Pasadena's Asian Art Museum to admire the beautiful Chinese landscape paintings and ceramics, or hear an Asian music concert. I also collected stamps and was curious about the often beautiful Sarawak stamps. And also, if you grow up on the West Coast, you tend to look out toward Asia maybe more than most Americans do. The multicultural, multiracial atmosphere in Los Angeles spurred my interest in Asia and its cultures. Thanks to my university, I was able to spend an undergraduate year, 1962-1963, studying at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Coincidentally, those were the same years that the Malaysian merger came together. A few Chinese students from Southeast Asia studied at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and became particularly close, I became particularly close to the students from Sabah what was then British North Borneo, and Singapore. The poor Saba students, though, would get teased by the seemingly more sophisticated, in their own minds at least, Hong Kong students, about perhaps being the descendants of headhunters, which was not something that they wanted to hear, and it was not true. I visited several of my Saba friends on my way to Sarawak stopping in Kota Kinabalu and traveling around a bit in Sabah. When I began graduate studies on Asia at the University of Hawaii in 1964 on a fellowship from the East-West Center, which you see a building you see up here, the university had just acquired a large collection of historical materials on Sarawak, which I used for several research papers. 
I also shared, I must admit, quite a few beers and meals with students from Sarawak at the, at the East West Center, including, among others, Lucas Chin, who later became the director of the Sarawak Museum, Fong Hong Ka, who later published several books on the history of Hakkas in Sarawak, Lim Chuan Chen, whose family owned, and maybe still does, as far as I know, a coffee shop on Carpenter Street, where I spent quite a bit of time, Dennis Liu and Tan Siu Sin. Financial support from the East West Center allowed me to undertake a one year of field work in Sarawak in 1965, 1966. Kuching proved a hospitable and also interesting place to undertake research. Sarawak was undergoing a significant political change, an awakening as Western colonialism in Asia was winding down. As a result, under pressure or enticement from British and Malayan leaders, the leaders of Sarawak and Sabah, some of them anyway, uh, agreed that, they, that the state should join the Federation of Malaysia in 1963. But not all Sarawakians agreed with this, believing correctly, as it turned out, that Kuala Lumpur would end up dominating the Borneo states. Uh, and the debates were often heated, as anybody who hung out in a coffee shop in Kuching or, or many other places could probably tell you. Various political parties, often with clashing visions, competed for power in the new state government. Some, such as the Sarawak United People's Party and PANAS, the party Nagara, began as multi-ethnic groupings, but soon uh, the identification with one or another group became stronger. Unsurprisingly, many top leaders of these parties uh, became, had been pro came from families that had been prominent for decades. I talked about some of their family links in several of my writings. The general pattern was for the various political parties, many of them identified then with one or another ethnic group to join into loose coalitions. There were and still are serious disagreements on the role of the Malay language, the Islamic religion, uh, urban rural differences and of possible Malay domination. This produced considerable movement of politicians uh, from one party to another, what came to be known as hopping, with some differences that has remained the state political pattern down to the present and echoes to some degree the politics of West Malaysia. The cultural dynamics involved here tended to encourage considerable cultural conservatism, but also stability rooted in customs, religious faiths, money politics, strong family allegiances, you know, subgroups like the Hokkien's or uh, the Mel Milano and so on, were starting to see themselves as uh, people with the same interests. One result of the complex political situation was a small scale war that broke out south and east of Kuching often as close as 20 miles away and stretching to the Indonesian border. What the government called the clandestine communist organization, the CCO, was mostly comprised of poor rural, often land hungry Chinese, some of whom had been involved in communist uh, activities earlier, but there were some others too, a few Dayaks and Malays. It, the, the, the CCO and its insurgency had the initial support from Indonesia, which opposed the, ma the making of the Federation of Malaysia uh, with its confrontation policy, confrontasi. Because of the fighting, numerous gun-toting British soldiers and a few Aussies were stationed in Sarawak, including in Kuching, and tended after a few drinks to make certain bars and coffees that they that they patronized off list, li limits to other patrons, including Americans. Uh, and so one 
if you were not British or Australian, you were sort of reluctant to go into those, those bars and cafes. My impression was that near the nearness of the sporadic fighting did not frighten most of my friends and contacts in Kuching. I don't think we worried too much about it. It seemed still far away. You just didn't go very, very near the, the border area. Rumors abounded that some insurgents came into towns peacefully to get supplies, but I don't know if that was true. The insurgency waned by the end of the 1960s, but the last insurgents only surrendered in 1990. As we shall see, sometimes in recent years, those disagreements about being part of Malaysia have returned and complicate state politics, but also state federation relations. In the 1960s, research permissions for foreign scholars like me were not automatic and often depended on the political mood of government officials, among them an autocratic state secretary. The main roadblock for some of us researchers was Tom Harrison, the longtime curator of the Sarawak Museum, uh, and a very interesting and knowledgeable uh, man, but also man, but also difficult, complicated, and controlling. A book about him was titled The Most Offending Man Alive. Fortunately, Lucian de Silva, the then dictator, the then director of the Sarawak Library, invited me to use their facility as a base. Eventually, Tom Harrison relented and allowed me to use a desk at the State Archives, which was then housed at the museum as my work base. He, Harrison rarely spoke to me the rest of the time I was in Sarawak, which was fine with me. The Sarawak Museum, of course, had long been one of the most outstanding museums in Southeast Asia, and it was a great honor to work there. Unlike today, Kuching uh, in 1965 still somewhat resembled a colonial area era jungle town featured in old movies from the 1930s and 40s, or maybe the jungle ride at Disneyland. From streets with crooked five foot ways bordering bizarre shops, old temples and bosques, campongs across the river, boatmen ferrying passengers and aging sampans, which they still do, although they may have updated some of the sampans, busy outdoor markets, uh, uh, sidewalk hawkers. Sometimes it seemed as if the old Raja uh, was still ruling from the Astana, but this faded, uh, 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 this notion faded as Malaysian reality took root. This was not a jungle town anymore, a jungle river town. I soon pushed out aside this, this outdated notion uh, of these jungle river towns full of street peddlers, sidewalk hawkers, uh, hard bitten crocodile hunters and down and out gold prospectors. I saw very few uh, crocodile hunters or gold prospectors during my time there. I arrived at a time when idealistic young North Americans, Europeans, Aussies, New Zealanders, and others were going out into the wider world with various organizations to contribute to helping non-Western countries seeking development. Although, of course, their motives and ultimate contributions can and were be debated. Uh, there were always a few people who wondered if this was just the white man's burden. But Sarawak had a direct role in the formation of the British Voluntary Service Organization, the uh, VSOO, uh, which began in 1958 and influenced President John Kennedy in the U.S. to found the Peace Corps in 1961. Canadians, Aussies, and New Zealanders followed, mostly recruiting young university graduates as volunteers. These international volunteers applied their knowledge to assisting or improving schools, agriculture, industry, health, and community development. The connection between locals and foreign volunteers undoubtedly benefited both groups. 
some volunteers even came back to live uh, in Sarawak. I certainly did not uh, meet uh, uh, many uh, uh, local critics of them. There were also a growing number of backpackers uh, bunking in the cheaper, oops, cheaper Sarawak lodging. The many English medium schools made good use of teachers from Britain and other English speaking countries, such as Graham Saunders, uh, an Aussie who taught at St. Thomas and then the Dragon School. Graham published several books on Sarawak and Brunei history. And then with me, we edited a collection of old photographs that he uh, that was published by the Borneo Literature Bureau and currently uh, issued by the Dewan Bahasa Dan Pustaka. Generally, with Malaysia and especially um, Sarawak and Sabah were viewed by many Western volunteers and their supporters as the ideal Peace Corps assignment, as places and people friendly to and tolerant of the Peace Corps type volunteers uh, and um, uh, were, uh, were all over the place. And they were also people who were able to make good use of the assistance. They were intelligent and resourceful uh, Sarawakians. Most of the Americans I met in Sarawak in those days were Peace Corps volunteers. Uh, or other academic researchers like Bob Pringle, Gail Dixon, and Herb and Patty Whittier, or they were aid workers. I also became quite close to the Australian political scientist, Mike Lee, who worked in Sarawak on and off and later became director of the Center for Borneo Studies at UNIMAS. Most of these folks loved, uh, in fact, most of the Westerners I met, in, in Sarawak really loved the place and its people. I should note, however, that this was not a completely unanimous. I remember meeting one naive Peace Corps volunteer from Alabama, I think, who went back home after a few weeks because she had read an article or heard about in an article uh, a crocodile attacking people in the Bataan Lupar uh, River area. And she decided that it was Sarawak's was too dangerous, too many crocodiles and too many snakes. She was terrified. But some of the volunteers in Malaysia became academic experts on Malaysia, including Sarawak, and later published important work. Uh, it used to be years ago when I'd go to Asian studies meetings, uh, in the US, there'd be a half dozen of my friends from who were had been volunteers in Sarawak who we'd get together and they'd all were interested and they would all written books or were scholars as well. There were they were part of a growing number of anthropologists, historians, and others who provided a sustaining basis for Borneo studies, growing in groups like the Borneo Research Council. Not so too long after. Many young Malaysians, including Malay many from Sarawak, were the ones on the move, going abroad for education, jobs, or adventure. Some of them settling in North America, Australia, New Zealand, Britain, or Europe. Women were among the travelers too, but were also getting much more involved in political, cultural, and economic matters in Sarawak. They attended universities at home and abroad, where they studied many topics from medicine and sciences to music, history, and literature. Pop music, whoops, wait a minute. Yeah. Oh. All right, this got screwed up here. There we go. Wait. I have come into contact with many highly educated and talented young Sarawakians. When I began my career as a professor at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, there were some 75 Malaysian students there, a few from Sarawak or Sabah. Most of them have returned to Sarawak and forged very successful careers. This is, by the way, uh, some of my university, Wisconsin Green Bay. 
Many Sarawakians of all backgrounds offered me warm fellowship, often involving the many amenities uh, in Kuching and other towns. In those years when televisions were rare or non-existent, even though there was little in the way of television, I don't think anybody was getting it when I was there, a few people had new televisions sitting in their living rooms for prestige, I guess, in the hope that they would soon get uh, reception, and soon they did. Instead, many fine conversations enlivened my leisure hours in the top uh, ve venues of the day, such as Electra House, the first local shopping center, uh, opened in 1965. The open market, where you could often meet local politicians like Abdul Taib Mahmoud, who uh, in those days was not quite as wealthy and well-known as he is today. Coffee shops and cafes on Carpenter Street, India Street, and Main Bazaar. Uh, the Aurora Hotel, the best hotel and place for Western food. The museum gardens, especially when they had their band concerts. Boat trips to Santabon and elsewhere. I still dream of the curry rice and the char siu at An Lee, An Lee Restaurant on Carpenter Street. I don't, I've heard that they have moved, uh, but I certainly remember them. I should also mention something many of you may not have ever heard of, um, the Hesh House Harriers. The Hesh House Harriers were a motley but fun group of locals and Westerners who met regularly to run through the fields and woods around Kuching looking for markers and told you which was where to go find the next one. And then at the end, swigging lots of beer. I suspect that was the main reason actually for doing the running. I confess I occasionally joined them. From the 1950s through the 1970s, there were many small family owned um, mom and pop stores where young people uh, often bought drinks, snacks, and ice packs. I quickly appreciated the special charm of Kuching with its still historical downtown core and friendly people, the achievements of Sarawak's diverse people and often spectacular sunsets. History was all over the town, including street names and old homes, business and, and gov government buildings. I rented a room in Tong Wei Ta's construction company on On Tang Sui Road, just off Rock Road. And of course, On Tang Sui, Tang Sui was perhaps the uh, most famous of all the Chinese who had lived in Kuching before that time. Like many in his, and his, by the way, his, his uh, descendants are still quite active. Like many in Kuching, I could not afford a car. And like many Kuchingites, used a bicycle to get around, even commuting uh, on a much less uh, busy rock road to travel from downtown to my room several miles south. People in towns I visited around the state in Samangan, Batong, Lundu, Cebu, Kapit, Balaga, demonstrated the same hospitality. Getting to some of these towns was not always easy. Outside the big towns, like Kuching or Cebu, many roads, if they existed, were mostly heavily potholed dirt or gravel. Reaching interior communities, upriver communities, like Kapit and Balaga, meant traveling by river boats, such as the ones you see here, or small plains, and then hiking up muddy, or scrambling up really muddy river banks. I still remember uh, both Balaga and Kapit fondly. I spent a, a few very happy days there. It, but getting to these places was worth it, even scrambling up through the mud, Whittle, whiling away some time and chatting with the denizens of a coffee shop or a food stall in any Sarawak town. Uh, including Kuching, lubricated perhaps by several cups of kopi or a cold tiger beer or two, remains for me one of life's great pleasures. And I did spend a fair amount of time in this particular coffee shop on Carpenter Street, I believe it's still there, which was the, the family of Lim Chon Shen, my friend who was at the East West Center, uh, ran this, owned this coffee shop.
the physical layout of Kuching, with its the Chinese largely dominating the bazaar area uh, and many of the suburbs, and Malays concentrated just west of the bazaar and on the north side of the river, and other folks scattered around did suggest some racial segregation in housing in the 1960s and, and of course, throughout its history. And communal tensions could be found in the political realm, certainly. But many people, uh, uh, despite the ethnic and cultural uh, diversity, many people still mixed and collaborated easily across these lines. Mixed audiences flocked to wayans, Chinese operas, processions, cinemas, and even coffee shops. This Chinese procession uh, was filmed in 1900. The Sarawak Malay writer, um, Haja Maimona Haji Daud wrote that um, in, in this in 1974, uh, that the Ban, quote, the Bansawan musical theater, culture, music, and drama spread and touched the life of all sectors of society and perhaps fostered unity among the multiracial population of Sarawak, unquote. When biking home to On Tang Sui Road, I often stop for dinner at the Indian stall, a food stall in a Chinese Kopi Tiam near Batu Lintan Market. It was also in Sarawak in the 1960s and early 1970s that I, already a music obsessed uh, teenage rock and roller and folky from my growing up, became interested in Malaysian and Chinese um, Mu um, pop music. Some of it played on local radio Sarawak programs. West Malaysian and Singaporean stars like P. Romley and his wife Saloma were already highly popular, in part because of their great film work. This was also the beginning of a modern recording industry in Sarawak, mostly Ebon or Malay pop with stars like Christopher Kelly, Stuart Tingey, Mary Jean, Veronica Roney, and Michael Jamat, who was best known for his uh, son Jogit Sarawak, a sort of commentary on what was going on in the state. If you're interested in learning more about that, uh, Connie Lynn, who's an ethnomusicologist and a Kuchinite, uh, has written about this and sees symbols of new, a new political consciousness in that music. Alas, the local music scene later diminished a bit in competition with the rise in the mid 1960s and early 1970s of a predominantly Malay uh, genre known as pop yeah yeah from the Beatles song, She Loves You, Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. Influenced by guitar bands like the Beatles with stars like Zalea Hamid, uh, M. Osman, Ahmed Jais, Adnan Othman, J. Kamasa, and the Rhythm Boys. English language, Singapore and Malaysian pop uh, stars like Naomi and the Boys were also popular. Chinese popular music from Singapore and Taiwan had a large audience. Among them, Teresa Tang. And I have to admit, I have been a, a fan of her music ever since I first heard it uh, in Sarawak. But Western pop and rock from the United States Armed Forces Radio in South Vietnam from the BBC and Singapore, spread the popularity of Elvis, the Pelvis, Bonnie Francis, the Beatles, and so on. It also became a huge influence on Sarawak youth, especially those educated in English medium schools. I remember when I first got to Sarawak meeting a young man whose name was Elvis Tan. I think I also remember a Ringo Lim or something like that. Nowadays, the Rainforest World Music Festival has put Sarawak on the world music map. And also there are some up and coming musicians. Uh, Z.A.V. is one that I like. I think she's from Miri. Um, and uh, I, she has several really fine recordings. Sarawak proved so interesting and enjoyable to me that I returned for another rewarding research uh, sojourn in 1970-1971 to collect materials for a PhD dissertation at the University of Wisconsin-Madison on the social history of Kuching. 
which I later turned into a book from Kampong to City, and half a dozen or so, maybe a bit more, journal articles. Fortunately, my research grant was larger this time, allowing Kathy and I to move first into a detached house on Rubber Road and then into a terrace house just off Green Road near Batu Linton Market. Several brief returns for short visits over the following decades allowed me to check on changes and renew old friendships. In the late 1970s and mid 1980s, I also served as a Fulbright professor at the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur as a professor and researcher living and enjoying KL and taught a course on Sarawak and Saba history. I liked uh, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, it, it was busy and impersonal, but there were many amenities and lots of interesting people and things. But I missed Kuching. I missed its charm and its friendly people. Uh, given a choice, I prefer Kuching. But let me talk now a little bit about Kuching 50 years later. Time always brings continuity and change. As Kuching demonstrates, Fortunately, despite considerable modernization, Kuching still retains much of its charm and feel. Some of the most decisive developments in Kuching since 1970 have been demographic. Today, Kuching has been estimated to contain eh, 350 to 400,000 people in the metropolitan area, well over double the 1970 population. Much of this migration came from nearby rural districts, other parts of the state, and even from West Malaysia. Many of the new arrivals were Dayaks. I recognize that term as a one that's contested, but I'll use it for now. And the Dayak presence became more pronounced. I can still remember when they built the Ruma Dayak uh, in Kuching, a hostel, to accommodate a growing Dayak population back in my time there. I forgot about it. this was family shops and condos anyway. Uh, new suburban neighborhoods and housing projects sprouted up on the fringe of the city, displacing mangrove swamps and rubber estates. Some of these were multi-ethnic in population and residential patterns in these districts seem to reflect social economic class rather than ethnic patterns. Much of this development occurred on the north bank of the Sarawak River, including buildings, major government buildings, the state secretariat, the council degree, the state archives and library. Traffic jams now often clog the city's expanding road system. We shall see how the new autonomous vehicles affect traffic and commuting patterns, as well as how much pollution they cut down on. Suburban shopping centers increasingly challenge the commercial vibrancy of the old bazaar. So-called cold storage stores stocking frozen foods, rare in the 1960s, became more common. One of those cold storage stores, stores, of course, was the most long-standing, maybe, um, was the Ting and Ting supermarket, and it closed. And unfortunately, because my wife and I were regular shoppers there, the mom and pop stores started disappearing in the late 1970s as the original generation grew older and infirm and retired. Most of their children would just close down shops since those seemed old fashioned and were not that profitable, but a few relocated and expanded their businesses. Coaching entrepreneurs were even expanding to Malaya with several opening Kolo Mi cafes in the KL area recently. Although the traditional downtown business district centered on the main bazaar, Carpenter Street, India Street, Gambier Street, Padung and Kuhanying roads betrayed some signs of decay in the 1960s and 1970s. In the years since, they have enjoyed considerable renovation, including replacing some older shops with more modern ones and building a roof over India Street, which also became a pedestrian mall. 
in the past, all this in the past several decades. Some of these changes have been controversial. In 1975, Kuching boasted one supermarket and one shopping complex. But in the 1980s, newer commercial districts, including numerous large shopping complexes and malls and hotels in inner and outer suburbs challenged the downtown commerce. Skyscrapers now grace the skyline, including a Sheraton Hotel that just opened. And in 1923, uh, 2023, Kuching has introduced this autonomous rapid transit vehicle, which I'm anxious to see how that works out. There were, of course, also some poor migrants in Kuching and a few shantytown neighborhoods common to most cities in Southeast Asia. Kuching was also getting more creative with a new, much admired museum of Borneo civilization and many cat statues. This is, after all, Kuching, cat town. And wall and street art added new elements to the scenery. Busking and street art performances enlivened the city during the Kuching Busking Festival in 2023, involving all types of street performers, including singers, musicians, dancers, and musicians, magicians. But for the performances must comply with local customs, laws, and guidelines, um, with no elements of police, of politics, race, religion, and sex. It was also having a dress code and a ban on nudity. This is not Las Vegas or Hollywood or Miami. The increasing Malay social, economic, and political influence was clearly evident in Kuching with more Malay enterprises and organizations, a stronger Islamic presence with beautiful new mosques, and the increasing use of the Malay language in state administration and official business. The destruction of the old downtown mosque in 1967 was perhaps a sign of things to come. And yet, despite a gradual decline in English medium and Chinese medium education, English and Chinese are still widely used in everyday life and taught in the schools, well, English at least. Um, while Kuching remained relatively free from serious communal strife, the Chinese, Malay, and Dayak leaders were increasingly competitive in the political, economic, and social economic life of the town. And coalitions of political parties remain the dominant pattern, as exemplified by Gabungan Party Sarawak, GPS, which governs the state and is part of the ruling coalition in the federal government. The city as a whole has reflected considerable energy, prosperity, and development. Some of Kuching's growth was financed by profits from the expanding oil, timber, and oil palm industries. Um, as well as hydroelectric. But critics point to the environmental devastation and the enrichment mainly of super wealthy tycoons who own the biggest companies, uh, as well as some well-placed uh, government uh, officials and politicians. Kuching is subject to the broader trends in the state and the nation. A few years ago, I was invited to come to Canada as a consultant on a palm oil project they were beginning in Sarawak, but they found the local people uncooperative and unwilling to trade their current life to move onto a plantation. My two anthropologist colleagues who were there, uh, both of whom had long experience working with Dayak, uh, Dayaks in Sarawak, argued that laboring on a palm oil plantation was much less interesting much more damaging to the environment and harder work than shifting cultivation as small farmers. I don't know how the Canadian Development Agency resolved the deadlock, uh, if it's possible to. Some business and political leaders have been suspected, of course, of corruption, not unusual. The Sarawak nationalism that was prominent in the 1940s through the 60s, certainly, has begun to emerge again, with many arguing for more local control and even autonomy, as well as a larger share of revenues produced by Sarawakians. 
and exploitation of Sarawak's natural resources, such as oil and timber. I recently saw a conversation on Facebook generated by a post, arguing that had Sarawak followed Singapore's path in the 1960s of staying out of Malaysia, it might be as rich as Singapore is today, because Malaya sucked up, it, he argued, uh, Sarawak resources and revenues. The post, as you might expect, generated some debate among those uh, uh, who um, uh, supported and those who opposed the notion of secession of some sort from Malaysia. But some argued that the federal government would not cooperate with or recognize such a move, and that Indonesia might assert old claims to the territory if it, they, if it did succeed. Who knows whether divorce from the Federation is realistic or even coming or would be beneficial? That's a question for others to answer. So while Sarawak has seen considerable economic development, more opportunities in many areas of life uh, and higher standard of living, this all is the same for Kuching, of course, too. The mixed feelings about the Federation of Malaysia ebb and flow and have roiled politics in Sarawak and Sabah. Relations between the various ethnic groups remain less tense and more accommodating, considerably so, than in Malaya, not least in politics. <coughs> Excuse me. And the local culture tends to be more tolerant of others and their ways, including in religion. But economic development, or as some see it, exploitation, such as logging, plantation, agriculture, and hydroelectric projects, comes at a cost in depletion of natural resources and destruction of forests. Kuchinite, people in Kuching, excuse me, also face challenges from the feuding mosaic of squabbling political parties. Growing dissatisfaction uh, in uh, in East Malaysia with the federal government, uh, disillusionment with leaders, and the widespread belief that the growing <coughs> emphasis on race and relig religion uh, in the nation might disrupt domestic harmony and invite more conflict and internal security restrictions. How they deal with this challenge or these challenges remains to be seen. The future is for Sarawak Sarawakians and the people of Kuching to debate and decide, and we'll see if this is a sunset or something else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. I think you need to stop sharing. That's what I'm looking for here. It's on, it's on here somewhere. Oh, here we are, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got it. There we are. Oh, good. oh that's what you look like, James. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think that was a really, really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I think I'll start off by asking a, a very, very simple question. Uh, when you first arrived in Surawa, uh, even back then in 1965, uh, what were the local people when it comes to thinking about uh the Federation of Malaysia, after all, the Federation had just been established for a mere two years. Was a lot of people, were they very optimistic about Sarawak joining the development race with uh, Peninsula Malaysia, or they felt that nothing has really changed after the handover of power? I think things were in flux. I do remember that there certainly, I mean, SUP was opposed to it for a long time, uh, I believe. You, you're the one who wrote the book about it, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I remember sitting in a coffee shop in Cebu and uh, talking to some Ebons who were in the same coffee shop. And I think we were all drinking beer, but in any case, uh, and they were arguing vehemently that, that Malaysia was a terrible thing for them. Uh, and they were, they were opposed to it. And I knew some people in Kuching who felt the same way. I didn't, I didn't talk to enough people to get a sense of how the whole uh, you know, population felt about it, but it was clearly divisive. I think, and I and I even over the years, uh, I have when I've been back to visit, I hear people who are saying well, this was a big mistake. Uh, you know whether realistically people can do much about this is another question. But yes, 
We have a question from the chat room. Uh, KJ John asked a question. He says, when Sarawak and Sabah became uh, part of the Federation of Malaysia in 1963, why wasn't the Sarawak Chinese not considered concurrently for the status of Mumutra? In other words, why were the Chinese not counted as part of the native population? It's a good question because, you know, the Chinese have been in Sarawak and Sabah for several generations, going back into the, you know, mid-19th century at least. Um, but they're not considered Bumiputras in West Malaysia. And I suspect that's a lot of it right there. Uh, and was and remember, Singapore came into the Federation at the same time. And if you started allowing all those Chinese to be considered Bumiputras, uh, uh, which I'm not saying they shouldn't have been, but you can see how it complicated things. And of course, it was still the a Malaysian government, a Malay-led government that was making the big decisions on this. And I don't think I don't think you'll ever see that now, given the conditions, the political conditions in in Malaysia. Uh, but it's it's um, you know why why are children uh, born of Sarawak mothers or any M Malaysian mothers, but not fathers, when they're brought back, say from England, where they were born with, with their parents, not considered citizens. You know, I mean, it's another one of these kinds of of issues. Um, it's um, it doesn't make sense, and, and there's families that are blended. I mean, there's there are families that have, you know, have a a Chinese father and, a, and an Iban mother. And, uh, you know, they're, the families are all mixed up. And how can they, why are they not Bumiputras? Maybe they are these days. I don't know how it's changed, but I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Sure. Now, when you were in Surat in 1965, what was the atmosphere like when it was announced that Singapore was out of the Federation? Oh, <laughs> very unhappy. Because I think uh, Sarawak and Sabah I can't speak for Sabah, but I'm assuming it's similar. Sarawakians saw having Singapore there as a counterweight, uh, an ally against Malaya. Uh, at least a lot of people did. I don't know if every single Sarawakian did, but um, oh, I think they felt betrayed. Uh, and um, because, in fact, Singapore, uh, Sarawak's economic ties were much more to Singapore than they were to Malaya. Uh, I mean, the steamships, uh, even in Brook times, they went from Singapore to Kuching. They didn't come from, you know, Kuala Lumpur or Kwantan or something like that. Um, and um, so I suspect that, and I think there's still bitterness about that, but um, you know it better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> right. So there's another question from the chat room. The question is, uh, again, a bit speculative. It says... What do you think would happen to Sarawak if Sarawak had remained under the brute rule or under the British colonial government? Would it have been very different or basically the argument put forward by many historians is that uh, Sarawak and the whole British territories in Southeast Asia didn't really have a choice once the British decided to get out of the region? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I suppose the British had said, okay, okay, we'll, see. we'll stay a, a while. Um, but they would have they wouldn't have stayed long i mean they they were having to retreat they couldn't afford to maintain their empire anymore and they um i think that it wouldn't have just have been a matter of not very much time before they did, did it as all right look folks we've given you a chance we can't we can't do this anymore uh we're going home although of course some of them stayed but that's another issue uh and uh i i think i think i i colonialism is bad. British colonialism was maybe slightly less bad than French colonialism in Indochina or Spanish colonialism in, in you know, Peru uh, or, or whatever it might be, uh, or the Belgians in the Congo, for God's sake. But uh, the uh, colonialism was not good. And I think even though the, the Brooks, in, to their uh, credit had set up like a council, you know, the council uh, Negree, you know, to have the leaders of the Malay community and then representatives of the Chinese community, you know, in the government. Now, granted, they weren't really doing the government, but they the idea was they were consulting, at least. Um, 
So I, 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 I think, frankly, I think Sarawak and Sabah would have been better independent if it was up to me. I, I would, that would be what I would see. And maybe even join in some kind of a loose confederation or something. And I don't know where you leave Brunei with that, but uh, they could just build a big bridge over Brunei or something. And, <laughs> um, right. So another question from me, uh, in terms of the uh, so-called non serap community there, uh, people like the Peace Corps, all those people, um, what were your impressions of, of the majority of them? The, the majority of them come to Sarawak knowing about Sarawak, or most of them had no idea what Sarawak was? My, keep in mind, I didn't. I met some Peace Corps volunteers. I didn't know all of them by any means. Uh, and I met a few VSO types and so on. But I, was, I think it met, was mixed. There were some people that, you know, already had their BA degrees in history or geography or something like that. And probably or anthropology or whatever it might be, although some studied agronomy or, you know, something practical that they could use as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and uh, some, I think it wasn't that hard to learn quickly. You may take you a while if you were set off to work with a Kayan longhouse that, you know, how to get fit in, you know, on the Baram somewhere. Um, but um, I, I, I think they became fairly under well uh, they began to they figure it out pretty early on because they had to you set up maybe some of them of course were working in Kuching or Cebu or Sarike or someplace like that but um they if they were out in a longhouse takes uh take some getting used to that you know uh and as I know that there were several people I talked to who did work who they were helping with sanitation issues uh, and uh, you can use your imagination to think about what that might mean. But in any case, uh, they had to sort of learn. And there was always uh, some of them would ask me, I, I have these ideas that would really improve this longhouse or this village. But the pe local people are reluctant to implement them. They've been doing things the same way for generations. And... Uh, I'd say, well, you just have to kind of work with that. I mean, I didn't know what the answer to that was either. Fortunately, I wasn't a Peace Corps volunteer, though that's probably what I would have done if I hadn't gone to grad school. Um, but it's uh, then there was the type like the woman who stayed about two weeks and then headed for the, the airport <laughs> to go back to Alabama uh, or wherever she was from. Uh, there were some who couldn't adjust. I think they always had to send a certain percentage, small percentage home because they just, oh, it was too hot. Uh, it was, they, 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 the people they were working with didn't speak that much English, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There, there were always people that had had a rough, uh, or they had to hike through the, the jungle for on a dirt path for five hours to get to the longhouse. And they just couldn't keep doing that. I remember when I was visiting in Kapit and uh, I met uh, a couple of uh, Malays who were teachers for the Methodist mission there. That was Sarawak, where you could have Malays teaching uh, even religion, <laughs> Christian religion. And in, in the, they, they, they taught in longhouses around there and they would go to each longhouse once or twice a week and they invited me to go with them. And so we walked out about three hours in the jungle. I mean, there was a path, but, uh, you know, you, I kept looking around just to make sure. Uh, and uh, it, it was quite interesting to see that. But not everybody wants to do that. Um, and um, it's hot and muggy. And, uh, you know, uh, some of us are, some people are not used to hot and muggy. Um, right. There's something else that you mentioned during your talk just now, which was that, when you were there, right, you were also in the midst of the so-called communist insurgency in Surawa. Uh, was there any fear among the people that you're living with? Well, were you guys perhaps more careful at night or it never really affected the lives in Kuching? I, well, it didn't affect my life, although I'm always cautious. I mean, I, you know, I lock my doors at night and that sort of, I mean, of course you think about it, but I, most of the people I talked to seemed kind of blasé about it. They were still going down to the open market at night to eat. Uh, you know, I mean, if you're if you're a, a gorilla, 
what kind of that's a great target people sitting out in the in the tables out in the patio of the open market i ate there very frequently and uh i didn't see uh, anybody you know um you know with armor on or anything i i think it was still far away you did you could sometimes you could hear um uh, weapons you could hear uh, rifle fire or you could hear bomb a, a small bomb or something going off uh but it was it was my impression is it was fairly low key most of the time there were battles but it wasn't like vietnam uh it wasn't like something like that um certainly not like what's going on say in in, in israel and palestine today um so it, it seemed kind of far away and i think i just People would say, well, did you want to go up to Bao? And I'm thinking, eh, that's a, that's a little too close to the action or Syrian, you know. Uh, uh, so I would probably say, no, I don't think so. I'll, I'll wait till things clear up. Uh, but so one had to be cautious. But I didn't worry when I was in Kuching, even though there were these rumors that insurgents were sneaking in and buying uh, things, but they weren't coming in armed or at least ready to, you know, they were, they, they were supposed to be posing as civilians. I, I wasn't too worried. I was more worried about the British soldiers in, in the cafes and bars who might beat me to a pulp if I walked in and they heard my American accent, but not not to um, say bad things about all the British soldiers there. But Sure. Uh, looking back after 60 years, when you were there in the 60s and early 70s, uh, did you see the rise of uh, religious and racial politics in Sarawak or Malaysia generally? Or when you were there, things were fairly calm and people were much more tolerant? I did not feel notice it that much. I knew about POS, um, but at that time they were kind of pretending to be more semi-mainstream, I think. Though there were off and on times when you'd get some firebrand, you know, who kind of gave away the plot. Uh, but uh, I, I, and Pas was not in Sarawak. I don't. I don't. I didn't notice much in the way of Islamic militancy in Sarawak. And as far as I know, and again, I haven't been there for a while. It's not strong there, uh, or even present. Uh, there is what one Pas member of the Sabah State Council or something, but I don't think that matters too much. But I don't know uh, that much about it. Uh, uh, but. At the time, I I was pretty optimistic for Malaysia and uh, the especially um, uh, well Mahathir for a while, uh, but he, of course his reputation the early the first in, in uh, I had a I had some some respect for um, I'm blanking on his name one of the people who were his deputies who I met in KL and got to know um, Musa Hitam yeah Musa Hitam yeah yeah. Um, so I, but I think the real R and R stuff is coming more recently. Can I mean, it's, it's much stronger. Whether it's a danger in Sarawak, I don't know. I I don't know how militant Malay uh, Islamist Malay uh, uh, ideas might be um, right now. Um, but the point is, you didn't see any, or you didn't see or feel any of that back in 1965 or 1970 in Sarawak? Probably not. Um, I think people got along pretty well. It wasn't uncommon for Chinese and Malays and Indians and, and Dayaks to be eating down at the open market. I knew of, it wasn't that uncommon to see Malays occasionally in a bar. <laughs> uh, some of them, I won't mention names, but... <laughs> um, and um, but things change. I mean, I think things have, have tightened up not only for everybody else, but for Malays. They are, you know, when I was living there, you never saw Malay women in hijabs and in the robes. I mean, I'm, hardly ever. Maybe an old woman, possibly, you know. But I mean, and when I went to in KL, you know, women were wearing mini skirts, including Malay women, to university class at the University of Malaya. That's completely changed. Conservative Islam has really made a difference. I don't know how it is in Sarawak because I haven't been there for 17 years. But, uh, and I want to go back, doggone it. Um, 
But uh, if you want to send a, an airplane to pick me up here in Green Bay, and I'll come over for a weekend. But um, the um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's and it's you know it's live and let live as far as I'm concerned. I I don't care what they wear, but it it shows a, a difference. Some of I had a number of Malaysian Malaysian students at UW Green Bay, and most of them were not dressed like that at all. There were one or two who were, uh, and they've been they were there in the 70s, 80s, 90s at, in Green Bay. Not so much. We don't have very many anymore. But and now when I go back, when I went back last time, I was in Kuala Lumpur. There, they said, you know, they were all decked out and. Uh, they said, "Look, we will be criticized if we're not if we don't dress like this, uh, and uh, our our families will." Uh, in fact, one of my students who was not doing that, who was a Malay woman, but very very uh, free spirited, <laughs> and um, she uh, she said her parents sort of wanted to kick her out because she wasn't conforming, uh, but they weren't. They were fairly liberal, so it's hard to know. I don't know what else to say. Sure. Last question. Uh, time has caught up with us. So in terms of uh, Sarawak's development, as somebody who has written and studied world history, uh, the patterns of development that we saw in Sarawak, where does it compare with the rest of the region, Southeast Asia, and in terms of world history? Was the sort of development that we saw in Sarawak uh, you know, fairly standard for ex-British colonies, or were there something unique about Sarawak? Well, I think Sarawak is unique partly in just that it has this big indigenous, you know, Dayak, quote unquote, population uh, that uh, uh, it, it requires, I mean, it's, the, you have to find a system that integrates all of that. But I think Sarawak is doing quite well. Um, I, uh, I was just in Mauritius uh, a few weeks ago where I'd always wanted to go. You know, it's a little bit like... Uh, uh, Sarawak or or, Mal or Hawaii, which multicultural Indians, Chinese, Africans, uh, Europeans, uh, and I was surprised at how modern it was. I had come from Madagascar, which was a French colony years ago, now independent, of course, a very badly governed uh, country too, but uh, where the ro the roads were terrible and the people were nice and friendly and the food was good and the scenery was nice. But then I went to Mauritius, all the, not a pothole to be found in any of the roads. Uh, and uh, just, it looked so prosperous, relatively speaking. And Mauritius, of course, was a British colony uh, for some years, quite a few years. Um, and I would say Sarawak reminds me of that. Uh, Sarawak is much bigger. I mean, Mauritius, about the size of the island of you know, Oahu, you know, something like that. It's not a big, not a big place, but um, Sarawak, you know, they're building the, the Trans-Borneo Highway how, for how many years they've been building it is, you know, quite a lot. Um, and, uh, but if it gets finished, you know, I mean, that's an, that's an achievement. Sarawak and Sabah have a, a lot more challenges than a Mauritius has. Uh, not to mention that Mauritius population is, Predominantly people from India, a fair number of Chinese who have been there for three or four generations. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you have people who are hard workers, who are talented. They're exporting. Actually, a lot of the Chinese, young Chinese are going to Australia or Aust South Africa or someplace to work because they're getting, they have several universities on Mauritius, this little island of about 1.7 million people, maybe something like that. And uh, I think Sarawak has that potential. You have some, obviously, from the tall buildings and you have businesses coming in from outside. You have some industry. Uh, I think it's doing well. Uh, I'm impressed when I see the bridges. Well, some of it, of course, is the sort of stuff that's designed to impress tourists and whatnot. You know, the bridges across the Sarawak River, that'll, you know, these, all the, but I think I'm, 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 I'm fairly impressed now whether they could, I haven't compared it. I haven't been to Saba for a long time. So I don't know how it compares to that, but what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Craig, it's been a lovely talking to you. We just have a sudden last question, very, very last question for the chat boss. And this is a question which uh, I think you'll find quite interesting. The question is very simple. 
it comes from easy takey and it says when will you think when do you think Sarawak will be independent <laughs> <laughs> uh you know i you this is this is being um recorded uh, i i think i'm going to pass on that one um uh um i think when when it's decided by all parties that they can be independent this will is the time i don't know I, all I know about the mood there is what I see on Facebook and in, you know, the the news, the free of Malaysia Today and Malaysia Kini and that sort of stuff. So I don't I, I don't know how to read that. But I was impressed by that Facebook post that I thought really merited a lot of discussion more than it got, actually, just to see. So anyway, sorry about that. That's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll come to when they when they they have it and and you are elected as the first president <laughs> or governor or whatever. I will come if I'm still alive. Yeah. Uh, I will come to your coronation. Well, thank you very much, Craig. Um, it's a shame that you haven't been back to Surat for more than a decade. I think you better make the trip as soon as possible. Well, I'm planning on coming next this coming year if I can. Oh, good, good. Yeah, that's my wonderful, hope. wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Well, we hope you keep in touch with the Sarawak Initiative and allow uh, us to host you on your next trip to Kuching. So thank you very much, Craig. And I want to thank you on behalf of the audience. I think we've learned a lot about Sarawak, your impressions of Sarawak in the 60s and early 70s. And it's always very good to speak to people like you who can give us a sort of an outsider's look into Sarawak society. So thank you very much, Craig. And we hope to see you in Sarawak very, very soon. Well, thank you.